All right, we'll get underway because there's quite a bit of content to get through today. So thank you again for joining me today for our part two of our webinar series on the 2021 application for the John Monash Scholarship. Um, I'd like to begin the session today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands across Australia, wherever you might be joining this session from, and pay my respects to the elders, culture and heritage. So a bit on what we'll be covering in today's web webinar. Um, essentially what we're going to do is, the assumption is at this point you're joining because perhaps you've um, watched our first webinar in the series and have commenced an online application. Um, we'll be working through each aspect of the online application and going through some questions that I frequently receive um, relating to each section. Further questions can be submitted during the session at any stage through the chat bar. Um, there's a Q&A at the end of this um, where I'll go through any questions that are unanswered um, in the chat. Um, and then I'll also provide my details at the end if there's anything else that you would like to follow up on. So as mentioned, today's session is to go over um, each section of the online application. Um, so that includes the general information or, application, or the applicant information section, the postgraduate study proposal, proposed benefit to Australia, leadership engagement and impact, professional experience, academic experience, and the referee report, which on your application portal is called the request section. So starting with the first section, applicant information or general information, um, here are some questions that I commonly receive. Um, I'll go through them one by one. And again, if there's anything that remains unanswered for you, please feel free to pop it into the chat. Um, and we'll go through those at the end of the session. So how do I indicate I need to be allocated a video conference um, interview if I've progressed to the interview round? Um, it's really important that in the applicant information section, you list your current address um, so that when we do the shortlisting process for the interview, um, we can allocate candidates to a panel that is most convenient based off uh, their current location. If you're located overseas, this is where you would indicate you're living overseas, so we would know that you have to be uh, interviewed by video conference. Should I list a second degree option? You'll notice on the application there is room to list um, two options for your proposed study. Um, it's not strictly required that you do list two, although it is strongly encouraged that all applicants have considered um, a strong second option for their study. You may also have more than two options, um, that's also fine. At any rate, you should have thoroughly researched any of the options that you're looking into for your postgraduate study. Um, and relating to how many degree options you should list, um, it's fine if they are different degrees at different institutions, they just need to be fitting with the proposal that you set out in the next section, the postgraduate study proposal section. Um, and you should also decide if you're going to, in that postgraduate study section, go into detail about um, both your first and second degree options or just your first option. Um, either of those is fine. You just need to explain in depth about why the particular choice or choices of degree are going to be the best place for you to receive um, the skills that you're proposing are necessary to your overall career trajectory. We'll get into that in a bit more detail shortly. So how do I determine how many years I can apply for? Uh, you'll notice that the, uh, the scholarship is available for one to three years. So essentially how we determine the length of the scholarship funding for an applicant is based off how many years of study you're undertaking at a full-time study load for your postgraduate degree. So if you're undertaking a one-year master's or a two-year master's, then you're eligible for one or two years of funding. Um, or if you're undertaking a three-year postgraduate degree, there are some masters that are, that are in that boat, a three-year full-time masters, um, or more commonly, it will be for a PhD. It's fine if your study exceeds that three-year funding limit, it's just that the funding is capped at three years. It's not possible to apply for the scholarship to complete a one-year degree part-time over two years with two years of funding. If you were to do that, you're still only eligible for one year of funding. So what is the purpose of the budget that I'm asked to submit and what should I include? 
So this budget is a good opportunity for you to show that you've done some research into, into the requirements of, of your time overseas, including your financial commitment. So what we would like to see you including in the budget is just a broad overview of what the projected cost will be for your entire time overseas. I would suggest that you look into the expenses for the tuition, accommodation, insurance and living expenses. You can look up rough estimates for living expenses based on where you plan on studying. The tuition is fine if you list um, the currently listed tuition as of the current academic year. Um, even if it is to change next year, it's, it's fine for you to have looked up um, the information you're currently able to, to um, obtain. You should also then list your proposed income to cover these expenses. So obviously you're able to project what this would look like if you were to receive the John Monash Scholarship. So you should definitely include in your income um, under the assumption that you'll receive this scholarship, how you then plan on distributing the funds to cover um, all of the expenses that you have researched. In the first case, our, our scholarship funding needs to be used on tuition. But depending on where you plan on studying and your specific circumstances, this funding may cover all of the tuition, living expenses and accommodation. In other cases, it may not even cover all of the tuition. So for this reason, we would need you then to cover um, off on how you might potentially cover a shortfall if there is one, whether that be through your own private income, um, some working hours, which you would have to then check are possible for you to do as an international student or suitable for you to do completing postgraduate study. Alternatively, you might be looking into alternative funding sources to cover um, any shortfall outside of the John Monash Scholarship, which could include further grants, bursaries, um, or fee waiver agreements direct from your institution of study. On that note of further funding, um, is it an issue if I'm applying for additional funding? You'll notice in that section of the application that it does ask you to declare if you plan on um, completing any other applications for additional funding. Um, it's no issue whatsoever if you are applying for additional funding. It's just a good opportunity um, to flag if you do plan on applying for um, funding that might be conflicting with the John Monash um, scholarship. It's pretty rare that there, there's only a few types of funding that are conflicting funding types, and that is that you can't hold a John Monash scholarship concurrently with a Rhodes or a Fulbright. However, there's no issue with you completing applications for these um, funding types whilst completing an application for ours. Um, you might also list in that section if you plan on applying for scholarships directly through your institution of study, uh, Rotary Grant Fellowship, American Australian Association Fellowship. Um, all of these types of funding are fine to hold concurrently with the John Monash Scholarship. So final question there, I'm an Australian citizen but I also hold dual citizenship elsewhere. Is this an issue? It's absolutely fine to hold dual citizenship and then complete an application for the John Monash Scholarship as long as one of those is Australian citizenship. When you come to complete your application for the proposed study overseas, if you're able to utilise um, domestic fee um, options by applying using your other citizenship, for example, if you plan on studying um, in Europe and you hold um, citizenship in the EU, then you might choose to apply using your other citizenship, that's fine. Um, you just can't rescind your Australian citizenship whilst holding our scholarship funding. So on to the next section, proposed benefit to Australia. Uh, one question I've been getting um, quite commonly uh, is listed up there on the slide. There are multiple issues that I'm passionate about. How do I narrow down what I meant to include here? So in essence, this section of the proposal is absolutely vital um, to the overall, I guess, cohesiveness of what you're submitting to the online assessors. So whilst it's great to have um, broad passions and, and multiple things that, you're, um, that you really care about, in this section, what we're looking to see is you, you are highlighting a very specific issue that you're passionate about and why it's important to Australia and how it very clearly links to the study that you're proposing and the vision you see for changing or improving this vision in the future. 
So it's a good opportunity to really hone in on what it is you're going to um, bring about for the benefit of Australia um, and why it's related to the proposed study that you're undertaking. And then of course, you'll be going into some further detail about how you plan on bringing about this um, proposed benefit um, in your trajectory and study proposal um, in the next section. So one bit of advice I would certainly give um, in relation to the entire application, but certainly um, relevant to this section, is that um, whilst we are talking about the application as a variety of different sections, they do bring together a very full and cohesive narrative that says who you are, what you want to achieve, why is this important for Australia, how you plan on achieving it, why the study is an essential part of you achieving this goal, what, what will the study equip you with, then how you plan on bringing about this impact and driving and leading and influencing this impact throughout your career. So into the postgraduate study proposal section, how many degree options um, should I list? Um, we sort of went into this one in some detail in the last section where you do actually list, um, where you do list the names of your degrees and institutions. Um, I suppose this more relates to whether or not you should um, go into depth about both of your options in this section. Um, as I did mention, that is completely up to you. If you have two really strong first and second preferences for the study, you might choose to explain why either of these might help you fulfill your ambitions. Equally, it's fine just to go into detail on your first option. Um, noting that should you progress to interview, you might be questioned on the second option that you listed on your application in that first applicant information uh, section. How much depth is required for the study proposal? This question is something that we quite commonly receive for applicants who are looking to undertake a PhD. Um, the postgraduate study proposal does not have to be um, the equivalent of your PhD proposal. Um, what we're looking for is that you've done research into why this particular institution and degree is going to equip you with very specific skills or give you access to um, very specific facilities or networks that are going to be of benefit to this vision that you have proposed. And then the last question there, how do I approach the trajectory after completing my study? We get lots of questions about the, the trajectory after completing study. Um, it is quite difficult to go into a lot of depth about what you plan on doing in 20 or 30 years. The advice that I give to any applicants about this section is to approach it not as a binding contract, but as a best case scenario with potentially a plan B, C and D about how you would ultimately continue to work towards this end goal. Um, in the future, um, taking into account that, of course, nothing is set in stone. So it's absolutely fine not to be 100% certain of what this pathway is going to look like, but it's a great opportunity for you to go into detail about what could be the ways that you plan on achieving this. So it's a good opportunity to evidence how much consideration you've put into getting to that end goal. Leadership, engagement and impact section. One question that we do get a lot um, about this section is how should I approach the question about John Monash? Um, and I suppose it's, it's a question that is quite um, broadly phrased um, and that's intentional because it's important that in completing an application for the John Monash Scholarship that you have done some research into General Sir John Monash, um, but also it's a good opportunity for you to think about, um, broadly speaking, perhaps what leadership means to you, um, what leadership qualities of John Monash perhaps you've looked into that you think resonate with yourself and your leadership style, or perhaps leadership qualities that you would like to be able to um, to gain over the over the course of your study and interaction with your fellow alumni, the John Monash Scholars Network. Um, so it's a broadly worded question because it could be so, um, it could be answered in a diverse number of ways. So there's no set way to really approach it. 
but it's just a really good opportunity again um, to, to perhaps take some time um, and to, to look into uh, the alumni network and to look into um, John Monash and, and his, his career and, um, and perhaps think about broadly speaking what sort of leadership qualities um, you think we're looking for in our scholars and, and what leadership qualities you think you have and how that might um, make you appropriate um, for the alumni network. So is there a minimum expectation of how much leadership or volunteer experience I should have? So obviously because our application is open to a very um, broad, ra broad range of applicants, we have um, only three eligibility criteria. That means that we often have applicants who are at various stages of their career. And for this reason, we don't have a set expectation of, of what is listed um, in, in this, this section or in the professional experience section, but What's important to keep in mind is that context um, is, is relevant and taken into account for, for every application. So if you're perhaps early on in your career and you haven't had um, a lot of time to yet um, undertake a lot of leadership experience or leadership roles, whether they be in your professional endeavours or volunteering, um, you shouldn't think that that precludes you from being considered or a strong applicant. Um, it's just an opportunity perhaps in this um, regard if you are early in your career that you would um, evidence whatever you are able to in these sections but then also to discuss in general um, more about leadership qualities um, that that you would like to develop further um, in the future so a bit more about evidencing your potential um, and less about evidencing um, your actual experiences. The professional experience section question that we do get very often is can my CV be longer than one page? Um, it does mention um, on, this, on this section that you can upload a one page CV. Um, it's very possible to do a one page CV. If you have to make it double sided then make it double sided but there's lots of good, um, I guess you can look up templates for a one page CV. Remember that it's what it needs to be uploaded for more of an at a glance um, your career history to date. So it doesn't need to go into a huge amount of depth about each of your roles because there's another section in this um, professional experience um, tab of your dashboard that asks you to list in more detail professional achievements where you can actually list them out and add more depth to them. So it, it should be possible to upload the one page CV. And then down the bottom there, there's a question about what if I haven't had a lot of professional experience as of yet? Um, similar to the last section, um, context is taken into account. If you are still very early on in your professional career, um, that, that context is understood. If you're, still, if you're just out of your first undergraduate degree or still completing your first undergraduate degree, um, the context of where you are relative to your achievement um, is, is certainly taken into account. So again, there isn't any minimum expectation, um, but you should um, you should still list any experiences that you have had, um, and and in lieu of having a lot of professional experience, perhaps you'll have more to list in your academic or in your volunteering section. And similarly, if you're you know much further into your career, um, you might have a lot more to add to that section than you do to your academic summary because it's been a great deal more time since you've um, been at university. So on to the academic um, summary section. A few questions here. Um, first one, how should I indicate if I'm still completing a degree? I'd suggest that you simply, um, in the part of the upload section, you just put um, the projected completion date and the fact that that is in um, obviously in the future indicates that you're still completing it. Um, does the transcript need to be verified by a JP? Um, it does not. You just need to upload a copy of an official transcript if you have one. If you're still studying, then your most recent results um, that you're able to obtain will be suitable. Um, and if required, we can follow up uh, for, set of, uh, for um, official copies at a later date. But, but usually it's fine for you to just be able to upload um, a copy um, from the university 
um, website if you're ongoing with your studies or um, a scan or um, copy of your full transcript if you've completed the degree, but it doesn't have to be verified. What should I put for the final results section? So under each, um, each degree that you list in your academic summary, it says final result. Um, I would suggest that you list um, an overall average grade um, whether that be a GPA or um, say it's a distinction average, you just list, list the final um, average result for your degree. How many academic degrees am I able to list? Uh, this section allows you to list up to five degrees. Um, each time it gives you the option to, would you like to list another? You just select yes. Um, if you have more than five, <coughs> Sorry, if you have more than five and you would like um, the option to list more, um, please get in touch with me directly. I can have it um, added to your application manually. And lastly, are my results high enough to be competitive for the scholarship? Um, I think, again, I know that I mentioned this in, in the initial webinar, um, but essentially you'll notice that of our three um, very broad selection criteria, which include holding Australian citizenship, um, planning to complete a postgraduate uh, degree overseas um, the year following application and selection, um, and having completed a full degree from an Australian institution, um, we don't say that you need to have a minimum GPA um, to be eligible. Um, however, what we do need you to evidence is that you will be a strong applicant for your proposed study overseas. Your proposed study has a very strict um, GPA requirement for entry. Um, you will need to evidence that you meet that, um, but many degrees don't have um, this, this particular sort of prescriptive um, entry requirement. For example, you might need um, a certain amount of professional experience, or you might have, um, or you might need to complete like an entrance exam or a GRE or GMAT. Um, so, as long as you're able to evidence you'll you'll be a competitive applicant, um, that's the important thing. And there's many other ways to do that. As mentioned, it might be a requirement that you have a particular amount of professional experience. Um, on if your degree uh, requires um, a GRE or GMAT um, exam to to be eligible, um, we don't require that at the time of completing our application um, that you've completed uh, completed your application for the proposed study. At this uh, at this stage, it's just that you're thoroughly planning for it. So um, consequently, it's not required that you list your GRE scores or GMAT scores. But evidencing that you have done the research into um, what the requirements are to get into your degree um, is certainly a good thing to do. So on to the request section, which is where you put in the details and request your referees to complete the referee. Um, section for you. Um, so often get lots of questions about this. So I'll go through a few of these on screen and if there are any further, I think we're not too far away from the Q&A portion. So for the first one there, who should I choose for my referees? So you have to have three referees and they can be any combination of personal, professional or academic. Our only recommendation is that you don't pick three personal referees you should always aim to have some combination. Um, what that combination is will vary greatly, as mentioned, depending on where you are in your career and your personal circumstances. If you're at university, um, you may be more connected to academic references at this stage of your career. Um, and by the same token, if you're you know, 10, 15 years in industry, you would certainly be more inclined to uh, list more professional than academic. So again, the context is certainly taken into account for each applicant. We just don't suggest that you have all three personal. And how you go about choosing them, I would certainly suggest that you pick people that know you well. Um, don't pick people based on title alone if you think they will look good um, as a reference for your application. Only list them if they are going to be able to make comment on your application and your potential as a John Monash scholar in a meaningful and dynamic way. So what's meant by that is they should be able to make comment on your leadership capacities or your academic capacities um, or your um, 
motivations for undertaking the postgraduate study in general. So the next question there, um, will they be contacted for further information after they've completed their reference? Uh, the referees could be contacted. We do, um, we do follow up directly um, depending on uh, certain aspects of our online review. Um, so they may or may not be contacted directly by the foundation after they've completed their reference. You should certainly always um, when you're telling your referees that you're going to request them to complete a reference on your behalf, you should always talk to them in advance, of course, um, and you should give them a little bit of an idea about what you're applying for um, and let them know that they're going to um, re be required to complete a letter of reference um, and they're going to receive an email um, that's going to come directly from your application. So it comes from an email address that looks like something like admin at community force, which is the application portal. But then the email then appears directly from um, the foundation. Um, but of course it's actioned by you uh, through your request section of the application. Um, and this, this um, email that they receive has quite a bit of detail in it about the, about the scholarship and what you're applying for. Um, but it's always good to perhaps give them some time in advance to think about uh, the selection criteria for our scholarship, which are of course available on the website, um, and how they might be able to make some comments on the selection criteria that's relevant to you and your, your study proposal and desired impact that you see yourself having throughout your career. Um, what will they be asked? So as mentioned, they will receive an email. Um, the email will have um, a link for them to go on to complete an application, uh, sorry, a reference on your behalf. Um, the good thing is that you'll be able to track whether or not they've completed their reference. You just can't see what they've submitted. You can also re-request um, at any stage through the application portal by simply hitting resend um, in the section next to where you've entered their details. Um, but essentially what they'll receive is a thorough a thorough email that, that asks them to prepare a one to two page letter of reference on your behalf in support of your application um, for a John Monash scholarship. And then of course it will also have a bit more detail about our selection criteria and how they might like to comment on um, any of those when completing the letter of reference. Other than that, on the when they follow the link to upload their letter of reference, um, there's also some details they need to fill out about how they know you. Um, and in what capacity and for how long. And then they will also have to put in their best contact details so that they know that they could be contacted for further information if required. Um, and then there's a short uh, scaled metric where they have to select um, sort of a number from zero to five based on our core selection criteria um, uh, that are all character based. So as mentioned, it's really good if you have worded them up in advance about the selection criteria and what we're looking for in the our applicants, but otherwise it's a very short um, and straightforward process. The, the longest part is certainly completing a letter, um, so I would certainly recommend that you give them um, a good heads up. And then also keep in mind that the sooner you hit the request button for them, the more time they have. So the referees all need to be submitted by the close of applications, um, which is the 14th of July, 11.59pm, don't need to be standard. Um, so if you send it to them now, they've got from now until 14th of July. If you send it to them the morning of the 14th of July, they have less than 24 hours to complete it. Um, and so the more time you're able to give them, the better. And we can't accept referees, uh, referee reports after the close date. Can I have more than three referees? Um, unfortunately, no, it has to be three, no more, no less. Can I change one of my referees after I've sent them the request email? You can change the email address, but unfortunately, um, it won't it won't regenerate um, a new reference altogether. Your, the referee that you've originally contacted will have the same reference number and link as the new one that you create should you change your mind about one of your references. Um, so in the case that you do change your mind um, about who completes that reference and you've already sent the request email, you should certainly let the first person you contacted know um, not to complete it because if they do it will be um, 
it will make it impossible for the second person to use the same link. And lastly, just before we move on to the Q&A portion, um, don't forget these really important, important tips listed on screen. I know that um, they were mentioned in the initial webinar as well, but it's really important to make sure that you're um, giving yourself um, time and space to really um, put together a considered and coherent application. And all of these things will, will play into um, that being uh, an achievable feat. So give yourself enough time. Don't miss the deadline. Seek guidance where you can. Um, I'm happy to answer further questions, even after webinars, of course, and, and to put you in touch with alumni who may also be helpful and happy to speak to you um, for any further advice about applying. Um, I'm not able to read drafts of applications, but I am able to have further conversations um, and brainstorm um, on questions that you might have. Certainly give yourself some time for drafting and redrafting. Um, the last, the two there about referees, we covered off in the last section, but do keep in mind that you should select them um, very carefully. They should be people who are able to add um, a dynamic layer to your application, because keeping in mind that at that first stage of online review, the assessors are only going off your paper application. They don't have the chance to meet you in person. The interviewers might, um, but you need to get to that stage. And to get to that stage, you need a very coherent um, cohesive application and the, the referees a great way to add a really dynamic interesting layer about your character or to perhaps um, add depth to some aspect of your application in, in a particular way um, depending on what capacity that referee knows you and certainly make sure you give them enough time and lastly um, always an important one is to take some time to proofread before you submit So I'll move on to um, the Q&A portion of the session. Um, and as mentioned, um, how this normally works is I just ask that everyone keeps themselves muted and puts any questions that they have into the chat. I can see that we already have a few questions there. Um, so I'll get them started shortly. Um, we've got about, got about 20 minutes left. Um, so plenty of time to get through some questions. Um, and I'll, I'll get underway with some of these um, some of these questions now. And I also will read them out loud, um, just so that um, the session is recorded, and then when it um, when we share the recording, um, there's some context to the answers that I'm giving. So a question here: I was wondering what you would suggest doing if we have any previous poor academic results. Um, should we address this in the application directly or should we focus on our strengths and only discuss this if it comes up? That's a really a really good question actually. Um, as mentioned, we don't have a minimum GPA requirement and certainly I think that it's pretty, it's, you know, it's realistic and it's common and it's very human to have um, some, some poor academic results along the way and I think that it's, it's important um, it's important to address it however you feel most comfortable. So. Firstly, as long as you first, as long as you're evidencing that you're still a strong um, applicant for your proposed study, that's that's the first and most important tip. Um, but then, how you might like to direct, uh, directly address it or not directly address it is up to you. Um, for example, it might be something that you'd like to discuss in more detail um, in in the section about challenges um, face, which I think is in um, the benefit to Australia section. There's an opportunity to go into some. Um, more detail about how you um, deal with and approach um, challenging times and hardship. So you might you might discuss it there if it's relevant, or you might, as you mentioned, just focus on um, simply highlighting how you are a strong applicant, um, which is also fine too. It really depends on the context of your own proposal. Um, but you should take into account that if it's listed in your transcript, which which presumably it is, um, then it might be something that's drawn upon if you're if you're um, if you get an interview, uh, the panelists may choose to ask you about about your um, poorer results and the context of how this might affect um, your proposed study. Um, I hope that answers that question. Um, I guess, in essence, it is 
it is quite specific to, to your own proposal and what you'd like to include. I, I would say I've seen it done well um, in both in both scenarios that you've proposed, either highlighting it um, and explaining the context of the lower results um, or perhaps how you learned from it. Um, and equally, not, not highlighting it, but highlighting why you are a strong candidate for the proposed study and the scholarship. Um, and perhaps if it's brought up at an interview, just addressing it at that time. Next question there. Do we need to provide details of academic achievements, for example, publications or grants? Um, I would absolutely suggest that you do. Um, there is space to do so. Um, in your academic summary, there's um, an additional free text section where you can list any academic achievements or awards. There's also room in the um, professional um, section to list publications as well. Um, whether you choose to list publications there or in your academic section is up to you. It just depends on the context of, of when you've published um, and if it was in your academic career or professionally. It sort of um, it can vary a bit, but there's no, I guess, strict um, placement there um, as long as you list it as relevant to you. But I would certainly say that, you, yes, you should provide details of all of your academic achievements, including publications or grants that you've received. Um, another question there, what is the recommended section to address any weaknesses in one's application? I think that, um, as mentioned, there's a there's probably a spot where it sort of naturally falls into, which is, um, as mentioned, that section that asks you about um, challenges challenges that you've faced, um, and that's a good opportunity to, to think about how you've um, learnt from challenging times, if, if that's... Um, that is one place where you could perhaps acknowledge it. If my first preference is a dual degree and my second is a singular postgraduate degree um, due to acceptance rate of potential universities, when answering the postgraduate study plans and 20 year career plans, should I address both study options? Um, that's a good question. Firstly, I'll address um, listing two different degree types for your first and second preference. Um, as long as your first and second preference are still going to be consistent with your future trajectory, then it's fine that you're suggesting a dual degree followed, or for your first preference followed by a singular degree for the second preference. I think it's, um, it's, it works out well, I suppose, in essence, that your first preference is the dual one um, because the in the case that that's the one that you do um, go ahead with and, and receive a scholarship for, then you are working on the basis of two years of funding. Um, and if you went with the second um, option, which is a singular postgraduate degree, um, and it's only one year, um, or if the first preference dual degree option is three and the second preference is one or two years, you're still only eligible for the amount of years you end up doing. Um, but if you have them in the other order, you can't up your years in retrospect, if that makes sense. So it certainly is, uh, if your first preference is the dual degree and the second preference is the um, single degree, um, then your years that you're eligible for is worked off the first option, the dual degree. Um, but if you were to go ahead with the singular degree option, you're not still eligible for the multiple years. Um, it then is changed to reflect the singular degree option. Hope that part makes sense but if you would like to go into more detail um, perhaps shoot me an email um, and then on to the next part about that question when answering the postgraduate study plans and 20-year career plans should I address both study options um, as mentioned in the um, in the session I think that it's up to you whether or not you choose to um, sometimes candidates do go into both options if they're um, if they've done a great deal of research into both of them um, and would like to do that. But equally, if you would prefer just to go into your um, first preference option, um, that's also fine. Um, you should just be prepared at an interview that you might be asked for more detail about your second preference. Um, so are the number of scholarships offered each year dependent on the amount of applications received? 
Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. It's not. Um, we say that we 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 do award yearly, um, and the number is not set. Um, and I guess that the the factors are quite numerous that play into that. Um, it depends on the final recommendations made at the national panels um, and the years that are being applied for, um, because obviously the years of funding available need to then be matched um, as relevant to the various candidates and how many years they're applying for. So um, it, it sort of depends if the nominations have many three-year applicants or more one-year applicants um, as to how many scholarships are awarded. In general, it's um, somewhere between 10 and 20. Is it possible to hold full university scholarships like the Oxford Clarendon scholarship that are intended to cover tuition and fees and stipends? Um, and then in that case, use the John Minor scholarship for other associated costs with the study, um, such as research, conference, fees, et cetera. Uh, so that's a great question. Um, luckily, I guess the, the Clarendon, for example, falls into the category of um, funding direct from your institution of study. So in that case, yes, it is um, it is eligible to be duly um, to be held at the same as a John Monash scholarship. Um, and and there are John Monash scholars who have been awarded the Clarendon scholarship as well. Um, and in the case that you've been offered. Um, that scholarship is directly from Oxford, so it falls into the, the funding direct from your institution of study, um, which is a fortunate situation to be in. Other types of um, eligible funding types that come direct from the institution of study include um, partial or full fee waivers, similar to obviously the Clarendon, um, or um, small grants or bursaries direct from the institution of, of study as well. Um, and in some cases, when applicants are applying for their proposed study, when scholars are applying for their proposed study overseas, obviously the benefit of having um, of applying after complete, of being awarded the scholarship is they then begin their application process um, to institutions overseas, um, able to state that they come with some amount of funding already, and um, that can be helpful for um, partially matched um, fee waivers if the, if the tuition is quite expensive, um, they might then um, be eligible for other types of, of funding to match or cover a shortfall. If you're unsuccessful in your application, can you apply again in the future? Absolutely. There's no limit to the amount of times that you can apply for the John Monash Scholarship. And I should note that many of our scholars applied more than once before they were successful. Um, and it's it's a, a great testament to your dedication to the um, to the vision and impact that you're working towards and, and looking to to work towards for your, throughout your career that you're able to come back and apply again. Obviously, it's a really lengthy process and and can be um, you know certainly if you go through the interview rounds as well, it goes for you know several months from now. Um, and there's feedback available at all stages of our um, application and selection process. So. After the applications close, we go to an online review. If you don't get shortlisted for an interview, you're welcome to seek feedback um, on how your application fared at that first round. Um, we just do that after the whole selection round is finished, so you, you can't seek it out until about November, but certainly you're able to obtain it before applying again for the John Monash Fellowship. Um, also, if you go through the interview rounds, you're able to get um, feedback after both the first round of interviews the national interviews as well. Uh, would seeking to undertake a nine month master's make you ineligible? Um, no, it wouldn't make you ineligible. Um, there's, yeah, that would, you would just be in the boat of that would, that would fall into the one month, uh, one year of scholarship funding um, because it's sort of the, the majority of, a, of the calendar year and an academic calendar year. So that, that would definitely be eligible. And there, yeah, there are quite a few master's programs that are that are ten months or somewhere between nine and nine and twelve months. Uh, what happens if you do get the scholarship but you don't get admitted into the school next year? 
Um, so I'll address this one uh, question at a, in each section that you've proposed them. So first part, what happens if you do get the scholarship and you don't get admitted to the school that you would like to go to next year? Can you apply to the school again in, in the following year and still have the scholarship? Is it possible to know what the approximate success rate is between applications to first interview to final interview? Um, okay, so I'll start with the first part about what happens if you do get a scholarship but don't get in um, and answer that part and the can you hold it over to the following year um, in one go. So essentially it doesn't happen very often. Um, we, we mostly find that, as mentioned, because um, of the rigour of the process, we're looking at um, applications that are reviewed by subject experts at the online review, review stage in the context of the, and benchmarks of the discipline, um, who are then shortlist for interviews and then interviews again at the national level. Um, and then ultimately, um, the successful candidates are being awarded a scholarship to support that study. And then we do support them with um, completing the application. Um, so as a result, I guess, of, of the rigour of um, assessment, followed by the support with the application process to the, uh, to the institutions overseas, um, Ultimately, it's not very common that, that candidates don't receive um, any offers the year um, the year they actually end up uh, applying and, and going overseas. Um, in the case that has happened, for example, um, um, off the top of my head, a very specific sort of niche area, PhD, where um, the university was keen to take the applicant but um, unable to secure them a supervisor. Um, in that case, um, that candidate was able to defer their scholarship to then reapply again um, the following year. However, we don't allow deferrals um, commonly. Um, they're, they're something that you have to seek um, through um, our academic review panel, um, but, but certainly there are scenarios in which um, they'll be um, allowed. Obviously, um, extreme circumstances that might stop um, a scholar from being able to go over overseas. Um, so, so there's, there are cases in which um, candidates have held over their scholarship um, to then to then go the next year or to reapply the next year. Um, for example, um, obviously with COVID-19 and international travel being uh, a little up in the air at the moment, our 2020 cohort of scholars would be eligible to defer their studies from this year to next on the basis of very extreme circumstances. Um, and should it be the case that that is still um, a factor in play next year, the same deferral would be considered. Um, obviously, we, we can't quite project exactly what it will look like um, by, by September to October of 2021 when um, applicants from this round would be you know, most commonly taking up their studies. Um, and then on the question about is it possible to know the success rate between each stage, um, I can't give, I suppose, a, a sort of set percentage, but roughly speaking, we could say that um, we receive up to 300 and normally somewhere between 350 to 400 applications. Um, and it's quite a, a big drop off then to the first stage of interview where we can only interview at a maximum up to 110 candidates, an absolute maximum. Um, and then from the first stage of interview to the national stage. Again, we can only at the national round interview up to an absolute maximum of 40. That's, that's the maximum. Um, so that it gives you sort of a, an approximate sort of success rate through the stages. Uh, so what is meant by professional awards as opposed to professional achievements and academic awards? Um, so I suppose that they're, they're referenced in different sections. Um, academic awards, you have the chance to go into more detail about those in your academic summary. Um, and that's where you would list um, anything that you would particularly like to highlight from your um, academic history, such as um, university medals or um, first class honours or um, other awards just from your university. Um, versus awards and achievements and recognition that you've received in your professional endeavours, which would go in your professional experience section. Again, things that you would like to highlight 
um, in more detail, um, opposed to just rehashing exactly what you've put on your CV. I'd like to apply for PhDs at four universities, but can I only inform two on the application? Is that an issue? Absolutely not an issue. Um, it's just that we only list space for the two on the application. Um, it's great to have to have perhaps four good options, and, and it's wonderful that you do. Um, you're not required to go into depth about all four on the application. Um, however, if you were to be successful um, at gaining an interview, um, again, your your second option might be brought up, and then you could perhaps go into detail about your third and fourth option as well. Um, and then obviously at the final stage, if you were offered a scholarship and then you start completing your applications for these PhDs, um, we simply ask that you declare all of the applications you plan on submitting. Um, if there are more than those that you listed on the application, it's important to list them then so we can sign them off at that stage as um, appropriate, suitable equivalent to what you wish to achieve based on your application. Um, so a pretty simple process, you just sort of list the four institutions that you're um, planning on applying to um, and they are deemed you know, to be consistent with what you laid out in your application um, and the two options that you did list in your application. Is there a requirement of worldwide rankings to the, uh, to the universities I am applying for? Um, essentially, you can apply to complete your study overseas absolutely at any institution overseas. Um, what we're looking for, I suppose, is that you're able to explain why it is the best place in the world for your particular area of impact. So you should be looking, looking very specific to what's going to equip you with something that you can't achieve um, or receive anywhere else. Um, or at least, you know, in, if you've got four good options, that they will all be um, able to help you achieve um, what you're proposing in the application. Um, it, there's no expectation that you only list worldwide um, sort of brands. Of course, we do have lots of applicants who want to go to Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard. Um, and in the case that they go to those institutions, it's because they've done the research into why it's the best place for their particular area of study and their proposed impact. But by the same token, we very much encourage you to be um, looking into institutions that are very specifically the best place for your area of study, wherever they may be. Um, so don't be deterred um, if, you're, if your institution isn't one that someone uh, from our scholar cohort studied at last year. Um, it's not a matter of um, we'll only send people to places that we already have sent people. We're looking to uh, expand our global network of scholars to get um, broad international skills to bring back to Australia. So. Um, as long as you've done the research into why it's the best place for you, that's the important, the important part. A uh, question about can the scholarship help be held in conjunction with PhD fellowships? Um, and then there's quite a few listed here. For example, UK Wellcome Trust, National Institute for Health Research, PhD fellowships that usually provide a partial salary and sometimes tuition. Um, some PhD fellowships are fine. Um, the ones you've listed are absolutely fine, as long as we're still the um, the primary tuition scholarship, um, then that's then that's fine. Happy to discuss them in more detail um, if you like. So, so on the question about listing two course choices, if you choose two degrees at different institutions that are otherwise extremely similar both supervised by leaders in the field and lead to the same career outcomes and goals, and then you're successful at securing a scholarship, are you required to take up the position at your first choice or can you choose the second option if it's more, if you've discovered it's more appropriate? Um, absolutely, that's completely fine. Um, and obviously, given that the, the process is such a lengthy one, it's you know, not uncommon that people might, um, might discover um, more things about the institutions that they're um, looking to study at over the course of the process um, through speaking to um, alumni and particularly when you've been awarded a scholarship you then have the opportunity to receive some further mentorship from um, more senior alumni and that might help inform um, you know your choice between your first and section, second option as well so absolutely appropriate as long as your selection is, is consistent with the goals um, and ambitions set out in your application that you've been awarded the scholarship for.
Um, so there's no more questions in the chat at the moment. And timing-wise, we have come to the end of our hour, but we did start a little late. So um, if there's if there's any final questions, I'm happy to answer um, anything over the next minute or so. I'll just give it a moment. Um, otherwise. Um, otherwise, I will put my um, my email address up um, just in case anyone wants to follow up with any more questions. Happy to chat by email. Um, I'm, of course, I'm Alexandra from the John Monash Foundation. I'm the Scholarships and Alumni Manager. Um, my email address is just there on the screen. Um, and also keep in mind that we do have a another webinar, the final one in this series. Um, although we're happy to um, to arrange for another another session if there's interest um, closer to the the close of application, but part three is in um, in June, um, and there will also be a pretty lengthy Q and A with a scholar who's been through the process um, and able to sort of give some insights um, from their um, experience, um, and you can ask them questions as well. But there's this question there. Um, will the deferral of this year's applicant um, funding impact the number of scholarships awarded this year? Um, no, there's no impact um, from the current cohort onto this cohort. Um, they're sort of it's completely separate in that in that um, regard. It might just be that there could be a lot more um, going overseas at one time in in 2021. Um, but otherwise, there are details about. Um, about the webinar series on the website there, um, and you can also find um, further details about uh, dates for the interview round. Um, if you're completing an application, you can expect to receive some emails from me just with some sort of um, weekly uh, suggestions and tips. Um, normally, I'll start sending them out. Um, Sort of weekly on a Friday from here on out, um, and you can also respond to any of those if you've got any questions. Um, but otherwise, uh, feel free to get in touch by email. Um, and lastly, I'll just note that um, we'll of course keep all applicants updated with um, with any any further updates about how the interview process will run. Um, I know I mentioned in the first webinar that obviously we're just sort of dependent on what the recommendations are for gatherings of particular sizes. Um, a panel is a, um, a group of you know five to seven individuals plus a candidate plus a representative foundation in a room. Um, and presuming that that's, that's appropriate um, come August, September, um, and uh, we'll go ahead with it. But if it's not, then we will conduct those interviews remotely. The process will go ahead, but we'll um, simply be keeping you in the loop if there are any um, expected changes. Okay, I think I'll leave it at there for today and um, and thank you all for joining again. Um, we'll all be in touch and, and happy application writing.